Carrie can go on and on, so we were really concerned about what sort of time we might have at the end. <laughs> See, I hit green to go forward. Uh, you folks, we've, we've heard from you in the past, ever since we started having these conferences, that one of your most pressing needs was to have a home fee monitor so you didn't have to do your blood spot and send it out and get your results in seven to ten days. Like some of our folks said, it's like driving a Ferrari with a 30-second delay. <clears throat> so in, in October of uh, 2013, the Alliance partnered with Innocentive to uh, put together a challenge to the scientific and technical community to develop a home fee monitor. Innocentive was a spin-out of Eli Lilly. They started it back in, uh, in the 90s when they had problems they couldn't solve, and they said, well, let's let other people think about how we solve these problems. And the process was so successful that they spun it out into a separate standalone company. So uh, the Alliance, along with Innocentive, worked to, to bring some funding together. A group of us went up to Toronto and talked with the Cundell Foundation, and they agreed to help support us. And so with our funds and the Cundell Foundations, we had a little over three quarters of a million dollars to support the fee, home fee monitor project. We uh, divided this uh, challenge up into three phases. Now the Innocentia folks, the reason we work with them, they have like 300,000 solvers across the world. And so we, we put together a, a challenge statement and sent it out to these folks and asked for them to give us a theoretical process of how they would solve the problem. So we expected about 30 or 40 proposals from these solvers and we ended up getting 128 proposals from seven countries nationwide or worldwide. And out of those uh, 128 we narrowed them down to about 30 and then we pulled together a panel of experts from across the world because these technologies were all over the map. And we didn't have the expertise ourselves to evaluate whether they would work or not. So we put together this panel of judges and experts. And out of those 30, we agreed to uh, make our first award in our phase one to, to give these, these folks uh, $10,000 to come back and give us a more detailed description of a project of a development program to get to a home fee monitor. And out of those nine, we got eight back, and we gave those, uh, we looked at those eight with our panel of judges and decided to give five of them another $10,000 to go back and look at proof of con concept. Take your device in a bench mode and, and work with some whole blood that's been spiked with various levels of fee and then uh, show us what you've done. And so when we got the reports back on those, we chose to give $50,000 to three of them. So they were then to go back and further develop their technology so that they would have a device that we could really take to the world and test on real PKU subjects. We had these uh, three solvers that we w awarded 50K uh, in their milestone accomplishments to go down to Emory. We were lucky to have Dr. Ronnie Singh and her group at Emory put together from their patient population a set of patients that had low, medium, and high fee levels to actually come in. We actually used normal subjects too. And where they did a venous draw on these uh, subjects, and we also looked at the plasma amino acid analyzer results as well as the dried blood spot with the tandem mass spec. So those were sort of our control blood fee levels. And then we used the prototype devices uh, to test on the same blood. Uh, three, three solvers participated in this study at Emory. The conductive technologies used an electrochemical device with sensor strips. Dr. Elaine Fu from Oregon State University used a powerless paper device using microfluidics and enzymatic colorimetric technologies. 
And Andrew Dennis came, but he wasn't one of the three that got the $50,000, but he had continued to work on a device and wanted to at least try. So we invited him to come on. And he was a sensor researcher and a graduate student down on the West Coast. And he was using sensor strips and colorimetric device. The fourth solver that we had awarded $50,000, BioTM in France, had a real big problem with their pro uh, program director, the project director. He had to be hospitalized, and they got, fell behind in their timeline. But they're using lateral flow technologies with a custom-made antibody, really much different than all the other uh, technologies that were being used by the other solvers. They, they were, had a device sort of like a pregnancy test, and we thought that would be a, a really neat technology to use, and so they're still working on it. <clears throat> this is the conductive technology device. These are the folks that also worked with BioMarin. You might remember several years ago, BioMarin attempted to put together a home fee monitor and they had problems at the lower level uh, and weren't successful. This device is, the sensor strip is really a small, it's like an inch and a half. You stick it into the end of the little handheld device and put a drop of blood on that little white circle there. And then in about 10 seconds, you get your fee reading. Dr. Fuse, Fuse technology in, from Oregon is a real simple technology. It's on a paper card, and she uses, again, microfluidics. You put your blood sample of blood, just a drop from a finger stick, on the little spot there, and then the, it transmits uh, itself through this microfluidic technology up the strip and goes through the chemical reactions and it takes about six minutes for it to do that. And then once the six minutes is gone, you fold the top of the card over on it and you get a color change that's indi indicative of the, the fee levels. So here's sort of the process you to do. You put your blood spot on with a, with a little pipette, capillary tube, let it, you can see the, the, how, how it progresses up the, the paper strip and then you fold your card over and, and get your, your reading. Again, that, that would be a really good technology in third world countries where, you know, you don't have electricity or anything else. But it's still very sort of qualitative and not very quantitative. Now, luckily, a after we had the uh, testing at, and Ronnie's shop at Emory, we, uh, we, we weren't uh, s successful at meeting all of our specifications. So uh, Ronnie's team, they, it, it, you know, separate from us, they put together a, a, a complete report of the testing down there. And the bottom line and the conclusions that we reached that were none of these three solvers that we tested really met the complete specifications that we had set forth for a home fee monitor. So we encouraged these folks to go back home and continue to work on the device. And they, we wanted to pull them all together in a meeting later on and talk about where they are and how we might collaborate with one another, sort of like the story with the Genzyme folks, see if they can put things together and, and will one person's help the other person's technology and so forth. And in that session, the folks from France participated uh, by go to meeting and we got to see their lateral flow technology. And here they have a, a simple lancing device for a finger stick, a pipette to transfer the blood, you put your spot of blood on the lateral test strip, and then you put a couple cc's of, of uh, fluid of running, uh, what they call a, a running buffer to sort of move the, the uh, sample along. And then they get a color change too, and they also use a reader to get a more quantitative result. Just to give you an idea of some of the data, we had uh, nine patients, or uh, yeah, I guess we were there, there were nine, two, two normals, on the bottom, on the x-axis here, these are the patient numbers according to their levels of fee. So the patient eight and nine were our two controls. Patient number one was obviously a very well controlled. As I remember, this was a young, a young child that might have even been on Kuban, I'm not sure. And then we had some middle levels of fee and then some high levels. There was actually one gentleman that participated he must have been in his 30s or 40s, and he had been on, on uh, diet and on formula for a long time, but then all of a sudden he, 
he didn't get reimbursed and couldn't get his formula, so he'd been off formula for several years and obviously had some pretty high fees. The, the red line on the, on the graph there shows the, the, the sort of the, the gold standard with the plasma uh, acid analyzer. Uh, the, the green line is the filter paper. So we've always known for a long time that the blood spot fee levels are real, a little bit lower, somewhere 10 to 25% lower than their true plasma amino acid uh, analyzer data. The two other lines are, these are the conductive technologies, and really they look pretty good in, in some of the lower levels where they're having trouble before, but they have trouble repeating it, and that was the problem with their technology of getting the same reading over and over. So when we pulled all of these solvers together out in San Francisco, uh, and we spent a whole day talking with them and sharing data and seeing where one could help the other. And in fact, Elaine Fu in Oregon is actually gonna be working with the folks in France because they're both microfluidic folks that understand how to move things along in paper and various filtrations and actually using some electronics in the process. But here's what we, we came up with. <clears throat> they, uh, we needed to further uh, work on the enzyme experts to solve the instability. One of the problems that we had with our testing with the folks who are using the enzymes were the enzymes weren't stable across a period of time and they had lot variations from their vendors. And so we, had, we need some enzyme experts to help us solve that problem of enzyme instabilities and lot variations. Uh, and then they said that we, we, and again, this is coming from the researchers, to have some renowned metabolic disease clinicians discuss with the FDA the need for a qualitative self-monitoring device for home use by lay per persons versus a quantitative diagnostic device. We don't need to put a tandem mass spec on your kitchen cabinet. But at the same time, <clears throat> you, want, you want to have a halfway decent reading and something that's, that's, that you can afford and on a per use basis is not too expensive. So they had a lot of talk about, well, is it good enough to do a low, medium, and high reading? You know, two to four, five to nine, et cetera, 10 to 15. We had some discussions at our scientific advisory board meeting that Kerry mentioned here this past Thursday. And I think it was a consensus there that we still wanna stick with our strict specification of being as quantitative as we can. So we're gonna, I think, hold to that uh, specification. They also recommended, now remember, these are the solvers that were vying for another $200,000 to continue their development. They said, they said, don't give the $200,000 to us. Go ahead and, and fund some of the research instability studies and also use some of the money to help raise two to three million dollars that they feel is gonna be required to support the product development to really get to the end goal. So we've had uh, a lot of discussions about that. And we'll continue to uh, have those discussions and uh, bring more information back to you when we get it. But the other thing I want to mention here which is extremely important, is uh, like Mark said, it's nice to have a, a lot of horses in the race. We've got people outside the challenge that are still working on a home fee monitor development. And we've been main, maintaining contact with five of those folks. Terrence Dunn is with EKF Diagnostics over in uh, Dublin, and they're using a the colorometric technology. Vamsi Pamula, is, he's out at the Research Triangle with a little company called Babies. He's been involved a long time with neonatal screening technologies, and he's working with Jerry Vockley up at UPMC and using a device that's detecting uh, phenylpyruvate uh, in uh, blood samples. Rudolph Gris is a, a fellow. He actually came to our, our meeting in Salt Lake City. That's where we met him. And he's working with Lucinex in Switzerland on, on a luminous technology that I don't completely understand, but we're stay, staying in touch with him. In fact, the last time I think Dick and I talked with him about it, I don't know, it's been maybe a year ago, Dick, on the phone, he, and Dick asked him, how much would you need to take it to the end? And he said, like a quarter of a million dollars. And then we had a, just a, an unsolicited response from a guy in Denmark. Peter Warthol is a, 
a research scientist been involved in the bio biomarker analyte analysis for various biomarkers across the medical field. And he had a, under, a real understanding of PKU, and he's assigned one of his research scientists to work on the phenylalanine as an analyte to, to put together a biomarker device for. And he's already says, can you get, if we send you 10 devices, can you test them for us? So we're maintaining contact with Peter to see, uh, I don't know if Ronnie's here or not. Ronnie, we may need to come back down to Emory and do some testing if we get this device from, uh, from Denmark. And then Marshall Sumner and, and Omar, you, you, uh, I think most of you know Marshall at, at Washington Children. He's been working on a, on a device, and they have a working relationship with a company that's trying to put together a prototype device for them now. And they're using either, they are not so sure they're using a spectrometric or, or electrochemical technology, but they're finalizing their prototype device. They still have some problems with it, but they, the neat thing about their work you know, we mentioned the enzyme instability issues with the other solvers. They've developed their own enzyme from a thermal pile bacteria. So they don't, and they have, uh, you know, no problem with it at room temperature and shelf life is good for over a year. So they apparently don't have the enzyme instability and lot variation problems that we've had with the other solvers. So we're going to stay in contact with all of these folks. So the bottom line is, what's the next step? You know, we've got $200,000 plus to award for a completion of a viable home fee monitor. And we're going to make a recommendation to the uh, board of directors that we offer a mini challenge to target industrial labs to help solve the enzyme instability and lot variation issues. And then we want to talk about this qualitative versus quantitative. I mean, if push comes to shove, if we can't really meet our specifications, at least a qualitative one would be better than nothing. So we still want to keep that on the table, although, you know, we would still have our goal of reaching a very quantitative device. And then all these five researchers that are outside the challenge that we've been keeping in contact with, we're going to ask them, what would you do with $200,000? Is it possible that, that you know, you, that could get you to the goal and, and have a device that meets all of our specifications? So that's where we are right now. We haven't had this full discussion with the Alliance Board, and that's going to happen, I think, at their next meeting to see exactly what our, our plan is going forward. Uh, I, so I hope, you know, we, we're still going to persevere. You know, that's the, the name of the game here in, in this alliance. We're going to keep on plugging. We know that what the goal is, and sooner or later, out of either our challenge solvers or these solvers outside the challenge, we're going to get a fee monitor one of these days. The question is when.